So a general rule is bank fees is faster than manual data entry. Bank fees facilitates bank reconciliation by doing something called pre-clearing the transaction. So when you actually download something through bank feeds, it will mark it clear, which is not the same thing as reconcile. So if you, if you actually never enter a piece of data into the register by hand and you do everything through bank feeds, reconciliation is a one click, right? In theory, right? Because everything's going to be pre-cleared before you get into the reconciliation. Also, Bank feeds can be undone, and that's kind of the real sexy part about it, that you can undo it and send it back into, into new transactions, and then you can figure out if you put it in the wrong place. Also, bank feeds are usually, think of bank feeds as giving you two choices, right? The choice of adding a new transaction or the choice of matching an existing transaction, right? When we deal with cash basis write-up, which is our bread and butter between January and March, right? We're doing all adding of transactions, but when we do bookkeeping or what I call collaboration with our clients, where we're doing more of a cruel and sort of uh, monthly reconciliation, then we have to deal with a lot of matching, right? So that's a nice thing about bank feeds. It actually provides both angles. The next uh, general rules here is there are four main functions that we want to get get your head wrapped around the mechanics of bank feeds. There's four main functions. One is called add new transaction. That's just pushing a brand new transaction into the register, okay? Uh, at creating a rule, which means you tell QuickBooks to do something for you, right? Which is different than add. Add means I have to click a button. Rule says it prepares it for you. You still have to accept it. Then there's matching. Matching is when a transaction in the register is already there and all you're saying these are the same for the purpose of pre-clearing it, clearing it before you get to reconcile. And then finally, matching an open transaction, which is different than matching an existing transaction. Matching an open transaction is, if I have an open invoice and have a deposit, match it to that invoice. I make the, the, the receive payment for me and make the deposit for me. Or if I don't have an open invoice and I have a, a receive payment, and that receive payment was taken through on deposited funds like it's supposed to be, uh, the matching can also grab that on deposited funds and put it into a deposit. So there's a cu couple of things that we're going to explore uh, today. Now let's talk about some terminology. Direct Connect in the QuickBooks desktop world, it's a service that you pay the bank. Right? You pay the bank 10 to $15 a month for the banking side. Most credit cards actually don't charge for it. American Express has never charged for it. Direct Connect is limited to what the bank can give you. So you really don't have much control about what comes in the bank. Right? Now there's in QuickBooks Online, in the online world, there's something called Web Connect Express. Right? which is sort of a hybrid of manual web connect and direct connect. So in the QuickBooks online world, there isn't direct connect. There is no way to get certain capabilities that you can with desktop. For example, in QuickBooks desktop, you can do bill pay. That means you can generate a check and tell the bank through QuickBooks desktop, tell the bank, go ahead and issue a check in my behalf, sort of like a mini bill.com. Right? In QBO, we don't have that. It doesn't seem in the short term that that's going to happen. So you cannot generate bill payments from QuickBooks Online the same way you could do QuickBooks Desktop because it's not Direct Connect. So because of that, you don't have the exact same capabilities as Desktop. Now, I'll give you a tip that it seems like a dog, but you may go back and go, oh, yeah, that's right. If you have a client in QBO, they should not be paying the bank for QuickBooks connection, right? I have a lot of clients that, are that, oh, QuickBooks, I want to pay that $10 a month, and they connect it to QBO, and they think those two things are together. If the bank is charging you the QuickBooks fee, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? The QuickBooks fee. That's not for QBO. That's only for desktop. So stop paying that because that's doing nothing. Oh, you're throwing money out, out of the door, but that's a different story, right? Now, WebConnect, right? This was introduced in the QuickBooks desktop world. WebConnect is when the bank generates a digital file. It's actually it's almost like a spreadsheet a digital file that you can manually upload. Now, what I really like about Web Connect is we don't have the 90-day limitation that we have with, Web, with, uh, with QBO. So if you're frustrated about QBO only being able to give you 90 days, right? Don't, don't do the connection through Web Connect Express. Download the manual QBO and upload it, right? And we'll try to talk, talk about that. Now, there's no date limits or capacity limits on desktop. So you can actually have a Web Connect file in desktop that's three or four or five years 8,000 transactions and there's no limit. In QuickBooks Online, it's best practice that if you're going to manually upload a QBO file, do it in chunks that is no more than 1,000 transactions, right? Over 1,000 transactions, it doesn't behave that well. Now, it can, it can import, but I recommend to try to do it in, in 1,000 transaction batches, right? And I think at some point, that recommendation 
would, would go away because the systems would get so good. Um, when you do a manual upload of a CSV file, you actually have a heart limit at a, th- at a thousand. So you don't in QBO, you don't have it on a QBO file, but you do have it on a CSV right. file. So for QuickBooks Online, the recommendation is the following, okay? Typical scenario is February 3rd, we get a new client. We need to catch him up for the entire 2015 and also get him ongoing for the year. So this it should be a two-step process. One, manually download the entire year as a web connect and upload that. Finish that, then connect the Web Connect Express on top of it and limit it to whatever time frame is so you don't get any information from 2015, right? That's best practice for this coming tax season. All right, so in so every bank is going to have a different screen. In Chase, which is the bank that I use, when you actually click on download transactions, it gives you the two choices. It says Direct Connect, right? And you see that it's activated there. That is for my QuickBooks desktop file. Matter of fact, this is connected to my QuickBooks desktop file. But in, in the case of Chase, for example, they say, no, download is free. We're going to do a manual download. Not every bank actually takes you to that screen that says choose whether the, the free one or not. But um, like Bank of America takes you straight to it. So usually when you then go to the next screen, which is the actual manual QBO file download, that's when you actually get to choose the date range. Most banks are striving towards giving 24 months worth of data. Not all the banks do it, right? So one of the interesting things about it is, as accountants, we try not to give recommendations about what bank to use. I think for the most part, we try to stay away from that. But if we want to increase our workflow, we should probably recommend clients to move to the banks that have better bank feeds. There are banks with crappy bank feeds and there's banks with good bank feeds, right? So if it costs your client $20 more in fees or whatever to go to a, let's call it a better bank, right? Consider maybe lowering your fee by $20. You'll get it back, multiply, okay? So encouraging your client to use a bank that you have success with bank feeds, it's another interesting practice. Oh, if you ever recommend a client to switch banks, make sure they don't close the other bank account until we're done reconciling and getting the documents, right? Because that's the other major challenge with closing a bank account that you don't have access to the documents anymore, right? Okay, so what if what if my bank doesn't allow me for a QBO file? That this happens. Sometimes the bank does not give you the QBO file, right? There are third-party tools out there that can actually take a PDF file and convert that to a CSV or convert that to a .qbo file, okay? I've actually, if you follow my, what I write in the webinars, I talk about that tool a lot because it's one of my favorite tools. And if you, if you have access to the QBO file, then just do the manual upload. All right, so let's, go, let's go jump in and do a demo. The, the manual upload process works like this, okay? There's a little button here called File Upload, right? And then we'll click on that. And usually there's either a CSV file or a QBO file we downloaded from the bank, right? This is for the manual piece, right? Not the Express Connect. This is the one that we manually downloaded. And we're going to go ahead and click on Browse. And that's somewhere in my desktop. I think it's in my Downloads folder. Uh, Actually, I created a folder here called Bank Feeds, right? So I actually downloaded the CSV file and the QBO file because I want to kind of show them to you. So if you can upload QBO file, .QBO file, Web Connect, that's a better choice than CSV right now. Unfortunately, the CSV import can only bring three columns, which is date, payee, and amount. But the QBO file can bring five columns, which is date, reference number, payee, memo, and amount, right? So reference number is extremely important for matching checks. So through a CSV upload, we can't match checks the same way that we do it through a QBO file. So that's sort of best practice. If you have the QBO file, best possible uh, solution. Okay, so we select the file, right? And then we click next. And basically, depending on how long it takes, it'll take you through a screen and it'll say, look, double check that your bank account is correct. Double check that it's the correct account that is being linked, right? To make sure that you connect connect the right account. Now, one thing to, to know about this particular process, once you connect the QBO file once, right? The second, third, fourth time, the account number, it's sort of hidden and matched. So you don't have to actually choose the bank account um, uh, a second time. And then you click next. And then what happens is, and I kind of did this um, before we came, then basically all the transactions come in this screen. So let me give you a couple of best practices of how, how to best approach this screen. Number one, when real estate in data entry is key, right? And distractions are our worst enemy. So we want to take away everything away from the screen that could potentially distract us. To me, 
Oh. <laughs> to me, this bar here on the left side, to me, is distracting. So what I do is I collapse it, right? So that's a little um, QuickBooks lab option where you can have the collapsible left bar. Definitely collapse that, right? So that gives me a little bit more real estate. The other thing that I do is um, up here, right, where, where the banks are, usually you, the ribbon looks like this, right? And it shows you every single bank and every single credit card that's connected. We don't need that, right? So we're going to also click on that and collapse that as well. Right. You can also let me dock this. You can also um, do the bank switching from here. So you don't need those big icons taking 25 percent of the screen. The other thing that I like to do is here on the gearbox, right on here on the, on the baby gear or settings box. I click on that and then I click on compact because if I have it uncompacted, yeah, I get that nice, you know, double space. You know, we're accountants. We don't care about spaces. Right. So we're going to click on compact. Give us a little bit more, give us a little bit more real estate and also rows, right? So I usually like to have as many as possible on the on the screen so I can start seeing what transactions I want to prioritize around. However, um, it's actually kind of good to have less rows. Actually, I wish somebody from Intuit was in the room and would listen that it would be nice to have 25 rows because sometimes the the, the more rows you take away, the easier it's for you to do a select all and exclude a few. Right. So I really wish we had a 25 option because that would actually make things pretty interesting. Hopefully um, I'll be able to demonstrate that here. The other thing that I really, really like, uh, actually, this is probably one of the most powerful. It looks small, but it's huge. It's this little option here. Let me click on that a little option here that says copy bank detail to memo. You have no idea how much that has transformed the way I function, because what happens is the, the, the specific data that comes through the bank, in my opinion, is sacred. Right. When our clients choose a payee and they do random stuff like our clients do, right? On the eighth day, God created clients. You shall do random things in QuickBooks. You know that rule, <laughs> right? Uh, right? So when they do random things, then our job is to unrandomize it, right? The problem is that if they actually override that payee, we don't know what, what it really was supposed to be. So having that option checked in there will also bring the raw data from the bank in the memo. That way, if you're reclassifying transactions or something, you can actually realize what was done wrong. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to see progress, right? So when I do bank feeds, I like to focus on the, the, the most amount of transactions first. That way, that stress from 947 numbers staring at me at the face, it starts going away faster. So one of the things I normally do is I go here to the description. I click on description and that's going to resort all my all my vendor names. Let's call it vendor names. And then I can take a whole bunch that are common, like ATM deposit. Right. And I'm going to go ahead and select ATM deposit. And for now, so I'll give you another best practice. OK. One of the things that I normally do is if I have access to the CSV file, I'll basically go in and take only the deposits and send a spreadsheet to my client and tell my client only tell me which deposit is not income. Right. That way, by default, everything else is income and we can kind of speed ways through. That way, the client has a spreadsheet, has a raw data. They don't have to go through bank statements. You don't have to send an email saying, is the deposit for five thousand dollars on January 2nd? We don't have to go through that specific inquiry. Just send them a spreadsheet of all the deposits and say, which one of these are not income? Right. So, for example, I'm going to go ahead and put here ATM deposit. And I actually do create customers. Right? So, again, let me put my tax season, cash basis data entry for the whole year uh, hat, right? This is not the collaboration monthly bookkeeping. This is a whole bunch of data entry hat. So I like to create a vendor that mimics that because if I pull a report of deposits and I give the client a report of deposits and it's, look, this much was ATM deposit, this much was, you know, EFT deposits, this much was a check counter credit. This much, so I, sometimes that gives, gives you some context. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click add and create a customer. Now, the normal thing is that a deposit is a customer. However, I'm sort of used to making them a vendor because in QuickBooks Desktop, in QuickBooks Desktop, it, bank rules only work with vendors. They don't work with customers really well. So if you want deposits to behave like, 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 like expenses, you want to make sure that your income components have vendors attached to it. I know it's kind of weird, right? But that's kind of the rule of thumb. So I'm going to create them as vendor. Because that's just kind of my practice. Again, ATM deposit is not a real customer. That's why I'm creating it as a vendor. Okay. And this is what this is the memo part that I love. I mean, this is wonderful, isn't it? Right? To have actually the raw data from the bank. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on add. Okay. And then what happens is QuickBooks automatically assumes that because all these other things called ATM deposit 
are the same, that it should all code them the same. Now, you see how the description here says ATM deposit? That's actually not the raw information, how it came through the bank. That is into it doing sort of an interpretation for you. So here on the gearbox, there's a little box that says show bank details. That gives you the bank's version of the data on this screen, right? Because to me, sometimes it's frustrating that Intuit does some of the filtering for me and clean up that information for me. Sometimes that cleanup is not 100%. So I'm going to click on show bank details. And basically, instead of seeing the raw bank data, I'm actually going to get the full bank data, right? Sometimes that context is good. Sometimes that context is bad. I actually love, thank you, Intuit, for giving me the capacity to choose which one I want. Okay, so now I see 32 transactions recognized. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And now those 32 transactions are not in my register yet. Okay, but because they're in the recognized bucket, and this is the power of um, being able to control the amount of rows. Because if I had recognized 100 or 200, maybe I don't wanna just say yes to all of them. Maybe I wanna kind of eyeball them first. But um, assuming these are all good, yeah, so so assuming these are all good, I'm gonna go ahead and click on the little. Uh, select all box under batch actions, and then I'll click on batch actions here, and then I click on accept. Now, once you become sort of a pro in bank feeds, you don't accept every time, like you don't accept and then go back, accept. I'm doing it just because I like to see progress, okay? To me, right, going from whatever that big number is to a smaller and a smaller number, that's why I like to focus on the big common transactions first and then go down from there, okay? All right, so let's talk about some expenses. Okay, so let me uh, come down here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the gearbox and switch back to the, let's call it the filter mode of the pays, right? And then I'm gonna go and look, take a look at a common expense here, right? So I have right here, Best Buy, okay? So there's something that most people don't know. This, this, may, be a, this may be new for some of you. I can actually grab, so without having to go through the bank rule system, I can actually click the first uh, transaction, I can hold shift on the keyboard and go down and click the last Best Buy, right? It will select all of them in group for me, okay? And then I'm gonna scroll up here and then I'm gonna click on batch actions and I'm gonna click modify selected, right? It's not intuitive because you really don't, that, that doesn't actually spell out what I'm about to do, right? Because I'm not really modifying, I'm, I'm adding it, but this, this maybe should be called batch add or something like that. Not sure what the right terminology is. Anyway, so I click on modify selected and then I here I can put my vendor Best Buy, right? And then I'll put here, let's say office supplies, office expenses and click apply. And that basically saved me the step of creating one, waiting for the recognition and then accepting, right? So sometimes that dynamic is also interesting, right? So I, again, there's no right or wrong way to doing it. I wanna make sure that every single option in there uh, is something that's available to you and that you understand how it works. Let's talk about matching. I think I only got about two minutes, so give me a little bit for, for matching. So let's talk about matching, okay? So for example, I'm gonna click on received here and uh, let me wait for that to, to sort. So I have here a deposit for 7,699.38. You see it there, right? Very clear. So let's say that I have an invoice already created. So I'm gonna go ahead and create an invoice. And I'll just kind of copy that amount. So bear with me, I'm gonna create an invoice real quick. So I'll have here a test customer and I'll pick uh, whatever item here, delivery. And then I'm gonna go ahead and paste the rate in there. And then I'll take it with a dollar sign here and then do a save and close. Now, so what happens is um, the way bank feeds works, it would actually, um, because the invoice is still open, it won't recognize it for you, at least not yet. But if I actually click on the transaction and I click on find match up here, and this, this was a very nice improvement over the desktop bank feeds. If I click on batch here, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do a, a date range uh, thing here because I wasn't 100% sure. Okay, so now I can, I can actually sort and search through my open transactions. And in this particular case, it was an open invoice. So I've actually, I could just click on that open invoice there. I can just uh, click on it and then I click on save. Now, if you have a client with an $8,000 invoice and a 7,699.38 deposit, and the difference, it's a credit card fee. Is that common? Does that happen to anyone? Okay, then you click here where it says resolve difference, right? And then you click add new transaction and you can set up the difference there. Right, so then in here you can put, um, let's say bank, 
bank service charge, right? And then you can put whatever the difference is. So if it was a $20 difference, I would put negative $20 and that will get me closer to the calculation to get there. So that's kind of a hidden feature that's there uh, that, that enhances on the match 